very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers as well. Uh, uh, Krish, Jainendra, Krishnendu, Rajdeep, and Shubhru for putting together this uh, wonderful meeting and inviting me to give a talk. Um, I'd also like to thank all the speakers who went before me today for changing their slots to accommodate me. Um, I'm going to be talking about boosted one-dimensional superconductors, and I'll explain what I mean by a boost as I go along. Um, this is work that's been done in collaboration with uh, Shani Rai, who is a, a graduate student at IISC, and my colleague Vijay Shanoi. And I would like to greatly acknowledge funding from um, the ISF UGC Indo Israeli grant. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk about here is up on the archives, and this is the reference. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> I should say that the reason that I got delayed today was that I was stuck in traffic for more than two hours. So it seems a little ironic that I'm going to be talking about perfect unimpeded transport, which is uh, superfluidity and superconductivity. But it's a little heartening that the first slide is about how you can impede that transport, okay? So it turns out that transport in a superconductor is not always unimpeded. And there is, uh, in a conventional superconductor or in a superfluid, there is this notion of a destruction of superfluidity or superconductivity if the, if the, if, if, if the system in question is moving sufficiently pa fast, past obstacles which are not moving along with it. Okay? So if there are, say, stationary obstacles and this medium is flowing, then it is possible, if it is possible that excitations are produced in the medium, which can exchange momentum with the obstacles, if it is flowing faster than a certain critical velocity. And this is what was uh, suggested by Landau and then worked out in more detail by other people. And um, so for a superconductor, this is um, a formula for the critical velocity, that it is the minimum of um, collective bosonic modes you know, given by a Bogolyubov type theory the velocity of that, or a velocity that you can extract from the single particle fermionic excitations, whichever one is smaller, is the one that will be the critical velocity. And if your superconductor is flowing faster than this, moving faster than this past stationary obstacles, then the superconductivity goes away. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> the assumption of this kind of theory, uh, or at least in the most simple-minded calculation, is that you have a superconducting order parameter, that there is broken symmetry, long-range coherence, there's a superconducting order parameter. And then the theory is written in terms of excitations about that uniformly ordered state. But as we know that having long-range coherence is by no means a necessary condition for having superfluidity or superconductivity. You can actually have superconductors which don't have long-range coherence, which have a zero order parameter. So you can ask then what happens to such superconductors when they flow past obstacles, is there a notion of a critical velocity? If so, how do you calculate it? And in general, what happens as, um, <clears throat> as, as the flow velocity changes? Okay? So an example of such a system which doesn't have long-range phase coherence, but nevertheless is a superconductor, is a 1D superconductor at zero temperature. Um, and here, the fact that there is no long-range phase coherence is reflected in the fact that if you look at uh, the superconducting correlations, they fall off algebraically. They, they do go to zero as R goes to infinity. At long distances, they do fall off eventually to zero, but they don't fall off exponentially with uh, coherence length. They fall off algebraically. And it turns out, so this is what um, the, the correlation function looks like. And it turns out that this exponent eta is related to the superfluid stiffness. So this is an example of a superconductor which has no long-range phase coherence, but nevertheless is a superconductor. And the question that we've asked is, what does a boost do to this kind of superconductor? Okay. Uh, by boost now, I mean, you know, you can think of the superconductor as flowing with a certain velocity, but I'll, I'll define, uh, so you can think of boost at the moment as being like that flow, but I will define boost a little more carefully in a couple of slides. Okay. So what is known about this problem? So it turns out that this problem was treated at the mean field level, where you actually don't worry about the fact that there is no long-range phase coherence. You just take into account explicitly the fact that you're in one dimension. And there it was shown that a boost does destroy superconductivity. 
but it does so via a mechanism which is a little different from the way you normally encounter such a destruction in Bogolyubov theory. So this is via a mechanism which is called a Clockston Chandrasekhar type mechanism. So the traditional Clockston Chandrasekhar mechanism has to do with how superconductivity is destroyed when you apply a magnetic field and coming from Zeeman effects of the magnetic field. Here what happens is that in this one dimensional superconductor you have left movers and right movers and in some sense you can think of the left movers and the right movers as being like spin up and spin down. And then when you apply a boost or when you make this thing move with a certain velocity, you are preferentially populating one species over the other species. So that gives you the clockstein chandrasekhar mechanism that's, um, you know, that's required. And then eventually when you preferentially populate one species sufficiently over the other species, it turns out in this calculation that you lose superconductivity. Um, but this is something which is at the mean field level. It completely ignores the effect of fluctuations. Um, another calculation was done which did take into account the effect of fluctuations and um, took into account explicitly the effect of the walls of a container in which the superfluid or the superconductor was flowing and it was shown that superconductivity is destroyed by um, the induction of dynamical phase slips and uh, various things were calculated. Okay? So what we have done is we have done something which is in the spirit of the second calculation. But we have not really talked about walls. We have thought about a superconductor which exists in the presence of a lattice. Okay? So this is a stationary lattice and then you have the electrons which pair up to give you this algebraically long range superconductor in one dimension. And so the momentum non-conserving obstacle in our calculation is the lattice. Okay? And so we have seen, so what we have done is we have investigated what happens in a situation like that. And so let me just go straight to our results of our punchline and then the details will follow. So what we've done is we've <clears throat> treated this problem in the language of bosonization, which uh, as some of, you know, some of you might be familiar with and I'll explain that again as I go along. So that, so that is the paradigm which we've used to treat the problem. And what we found is that contrary to what you expect, what you might intuitively expect in this sort of scenario, the superconductivity can actually be strengthened when you apply a boost in certain situations and I'll explain what I mean by strengthened. The intuitive expectation would be that as you boost the system, the superconductivity gets gradually weaker and eventually at some point completely disappears. So what I'm going to try to convince you is that in 1D in the sort of uh, scenario that we're looking at, depending on the kind of lattice or rather depending on the kind of dispersion that the electrons have, you can actually have a situation in which the superconductivity is strengthened by a boost. Of course, this can't happen indefinitely. At some point, it will go away and, you know, there will be a critical velocity and I'll talk about that as well. So that is one um, result. And the other result is that in situations where, because of the presence of a lattice, you, could, you can have a gap, meaning that the system is actually not a superconductor, it's not a Luttinger liquid, but is a gap system the boost can actually end up closing the gap or can actually end up opening a gap if there wasn't one and I'll show you how that happens as well. So, so these really are the conclusions and now I'm going to um, go into the details. Okay, so what we've done is we've treated this problem in the language of um, bosonization. So as uh, many of you know that when you have a one-dimensional system of fermions, the, if you, let's say, if you know, forgot about interactions for the time being, it was just a free Fermi gas in one dimension, then you actually have stable particle hole excitations which behave like bosons together and these are the low energy excitations. So the low energy physics of such a system can actually be written in terms of these bosonic excitations. This you can do only in one dimension and that is called uh, bosonization. So when you do that, you have, um, basically what you're doing is, you have fermions which populate some kind of a band and then you linearize about the Fermi points and look at the low energy excitations and then look at these collective low energy particle hole excitations as bosons. And then when you write down a Hamiltonian for such a system, it looks like this, okay, where phi is the bosonic field and pi is its conjugate field and V is the velocity, um, you know, about the, the Fermi points that you get when you linearize. So it's a very simple Hamiltonian that you get 
And this, incidentally, is something which also contains effects of interactions. This is not for non-interacting fermions. This is, in fact, for interacting fermions. Um, right? Okay. And you can write down a, a Lagrangian corresponding to the Hamiltonian. As I, and, in, and I'll show you in the next slide that the interactions are actually contained in this parameter k, which is called a Luttinger parameter. But the upshot of having a, a low energy theory like this is that you can have algebraic correlations of superconductivity and charge density wave order. And so if you look at the correlation function for superconductivity or for um, charge density wave order, they both go algebraically with uh, the first one with an exponent 1 over k and the second one with an exponent k. Okay? And k is something which is always positive. It's always a positive number. So whether this one dominates or that one dominates depends on whether k is less than 1 or greater than 1. So if k is greater than 1, this is something which is longer ranged. It decays slower and this one decays faster. And for k less than 1, it's the other way around. And I told you that k contains the interactions. So you can show that k greater than 1 corresponds to having attractive interactions, which is what you would expect would give you uh, superconductivity. And k less than 1 corresponds to having repulsive interactions which gives you this dominant algebraic charge density wave order. Okay. So, as I said, um, K contains the interactions as well. So, how does K contain the interactions and what interactions are we talking about? So, this is a one-dimensional system. And so, you have left movers and right movers. So, this is the energy dispersion. This is the right moving branch and this is the left moving branch. So, we're initially going to think about only spinless fermions. And so, when you have spinless fermions, in this kind of dispersion and you turn on interactions. There are two kinds of processes which can take place. One is that two fermions which are both on the same side of the dispersion, meaning they're both left movers or right movers, continue to remain left movers or right movers. So the scattering happens only on one side, which is this kind of interaction with the strength G4. Or the other thing which can happen is that you have one left mover and one right mover to begin with, and after scattering again, you have a left mover and a right mover. So you either have scattering between fermions on the same side or scattering between fermions on the opposite side. These are the only two things which can happen for spinless fermions. In the absence of a lattice, um, well, okay, in the absence of commensurate filling on a lattice, and I'll come to that later, there's a third kind of interaction called Ohm club, which will be important. But right now, I'm not worrying about that. And so these um, interaction strengths are contained in the parameter k and also in the parameter v. So your effect of interactions is completely taken into account in this treatment. You are looking at a problem of interacting fermions, but converting it into a problem of non-interacting bosonic degrees of freedom. Okay? Uh, fine. So now let me define what I mean by a boost and tell you what a boost does. Okay? So this, so imagine that you have some dispersion like this, and um, you have left movers and right movers, and the left movers and right movers have Fermi energies, which are symmetrically placed, or Fermi momenta, which are symmetrically placed about k equal to zero. So this k of zero, uh, plus k of zero, let's say, is the momentum of the right movers, the Fermi momentum of the right movers, and uh, minus k of zero is the Fermi momentum of the left movers. So now, what I mean by a boost is to say that the momenta of all the particles is moved, is changed by an amount u. So, what, so whatever had a momentum k now has a momentum k plus u. Now, as a result of this, what happens is you can see that now the Fermi moment, the Fermi momentum for the left movers is different in magnitude from the Fermi momentum for the right movers, because the Fermi momentum for the left movers now becomes minus k of zero plus u. The Fermi momentum for the right movers becomes k of zero plus u, and these have um, different magnitudes. So, so the Fermi, so this Fermi point, say, if u is in this direction, shifts more towards zero, and this one moves away from zero. Now, consequently, what happens is that, in principle, you will also have different Fermi speeds for the left movers and the right movers. Okay, so you have an e versus k dispersion from which you can calculate the derivative and calculate the speed, and um, so even if the dispersion is symmetric now, when you have a boost, you can actually have different speeds for the left movers and the right movers. And this will be important for what I have to say next. Okay? All right, so this is the setup now. 
So now you can ask, well, if you were in a situation like this where you took every single fermion and changed its momentum by an amount u, and now again linearized about the new Fermi points and looked at a Bosonized theory, what would that look like? So it turns out that what that looks like is this, that you now have a coupling between the phi field and the pi field, uh, these fields which are conjugate, and the velocity here in the Luttinger parameter also change, they also have a dependence on um, the boost u, and so the dependence on the boost u comes from Vf of u, which is basically like the average of the speed of the left mover and the right mover, and W of u is the difference between the speed of the left mover and the right mover. So this is how um, this Hamiltonian is changed, okay. Well, what's important is that the g's which are sitting here are unchanged by the boost, and the reason that the g's are unchanged by the boost is that we assume that the interactions that were there were momentum conserving. So even if you change every momentum by the same amount, the interactions remain unchanged. So the only change to k and v is coming from this factor vf of u, which is what explicitly contains u. Okay, fine. So again, you know, corresponding to the Hamiltonian, you can write down a Lagrangian density, which you can use to do a calculation. So what is interesting is that the Lagrangian density, actually you can also do this to the Hamiltonian. So the Lagrangian that you write down can be exactly of the same form as a Lagrangian for the unboosted system, but in terms of new fields phi tilde, which can be written in terms of the old fields in this way. So basically you take, you make a Galilean transformation on the coordinates, okay, and this is the Galilean transformation, x goes to x plus w of u times t and t remains t. And then the field phi in terms of these new coordinates is equal to the field phi tilde. So the effect of the boost can be absorbed, you know, so in some sense you can get rid of this term by defining new fields uh, in terms of this Galilean transformation. But the effect of the boost still remains in the Luttinger parameter and V of u. So that is important. It's not like you can just completely do away with the boost. It is there in these parameters. And so now when you have a Lagrangian which looks like this, once again you can argue that you're going to have algebraic um, superconducting order and algebraic CTW order whose correlation functions will be given by um, expressions like this, where the K which now appears is this modified Luttinger parameter which contains the boost. Okay, so if you want more detailed expressions, um, then this is actually what the superconducting correlation function looks like, and this is what the charge density wave uh, correlation function looks like, and uh, the space-time correlation functions. And one of the things that you can see, for those of you who are familiar with this, is that because you now have the boost, there is no conformal invariance, uh, which would otherwise have been there in the absence of the boost, which is not surprising because you're destroying left-right symmetry, so you don't expect conformal invariance anymore. So conformal invariance is gone, but if you were to now look at the correlators for these phi tildes, that would, those would have conformal invariance. So you can sort of restore conformal invariance by looking at these, um, these Galilean transformed fields. And, um, and that is the effect of the boost in terms of the transformation of the field. Okay. But the important thing is that there's a K of U here, um, which depends on the boost, which tells you how these correlation functions decay. Okay. So now let's ask how this K of U depends on the boost, okay? So K of U, as I showed you a couple of slides earlier, depends on the boost through this average Fermi speed. That is dependent on the boost. The K of U is a function of this. And this is an even function of U because the average speed doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're boosting to the left or to the right. So this is an even function of U. So now if you make a Taylor expansion of the Luttinger parameter for small U, you can get an idea of what happens. So this is a Taylor expansion. The, the linear term isn't there because this is an even function of u. So the lowest term is the u squared term, which is multiplied by these derivatives. Now whether k of u increases or decreases upon the application of a boost relative to its zero boost value will depend on the sign of, of these quantities, okay? And you can show that if you look at the first derivative, this is less than zero when the unboosted Luttinger parameter was greater than one, that was when you had attractive interactions, and this is greater than zero when the unboosted parameter was less than one, when you had repulsive interactions, okay? But that is not the only thing, there's also this quantity to contend with, and so this is 
the second derivative of the Fermi speed, the average Fermi speed with respect to the boost, okay? And this is very important. The fact that it's a second derivative, because it turns out that if this is equal to zero, then the boost has no effect on the Luttinger parameter. And in fact, this is exactly equal to zero if your dispersion was p squared by 2m to begin with. If you had a parabolic dispersion, then this is equal to zero. When you boost it, you can show that the second derivative is zero and the boost has no effect, which is consistent with what you might expect because, you know, then there is no way in which you're breaking Galilean invariance in the system and you would think that applying a boost would do nothing. And in fact, it does nothing, okay? But so the boost has no effect when the dispersion is parabolic, but it does have a non-trivial effect when, let's say, you have a lattice and you are breaking Galilean invariance. So the, simple, the simplest kind of lattice dispersion you can think of in one dimension is the one which comes from a one-dimensional tight minding model, which would have a dispersion like this. And what is interesting is that you can show that for this kind of dispersion, this second derivative is not zero. And not only is it not zero, it is actually negative, okay? And so this now has the effect that k of u, the boosted Luttinger parameter, is actually greater than the unboosted Luttinger parameter if the unboosted Luttinger parameter were greater than one to begin with. So what does that mean? So that means that if you had dominant superconducting order to begin with, okay, and you had this kind of dispersion and you boosted the system, then the value of the Luttinger parameter increases, it becomes even greater than one, and the superconducting correlations fall off even slower. So in that sense, superconductivity is strengthened when you apply a boost, but I should emphasize that this is because of this kind of dispersion. This is not true of all kinds of dispersion. It really depends on the sign of this quantity, okay? And, but for this kind of dispersion, this is what happens. And similarly, if k of u, if k were less than one to begin with, that you had dominant CDW correlations, then k becomes even smaller and those correlations get even more dominant. So even C, dominant CDW order is also strengthened for this kind of dispersion upon the application of a boost, okay? We've been talking about spinless fermions. Uh, it turns out that this is also true for spin half fermions, and I talk about spin half fermions in just a little bit. Um, now, you might wonder whether this can happen indefinitely, because you know, it doesn't make sense for you to keep thinking that as you increase the boost, the superconductivity will continue to get strengthened, because then you know, there's really no meaning to anything like a critical velocity. So what happens is that as you increase the boost, the asymmetry between the left movers and the right movers starts getting to be larger and larger. And at some point, one of them is going to reach the bottom of the band or the top of the band where you can't linearize anymore, okay? And beyond that, of course, this breaks down. So in this kind of treatment, it turns out that the natural, um, the, 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 you know, what acts as the critical velocity is really something as large as the Fermi velocity or, or you know, the diff, whichever, the, the velocity that's required to make one of the movers move to a, either the band bottom or the band end. And that is where, of course, this breaks down. And then beyond that, your uh, Fermi C becomes unstable. The ground state is not the one that we considered it to be. And of course, the system is then no longer um, superconducting. So, yeah. No, okay, sorry. So the, so the Landau argument, so are you saying the Landau argument depends on not being able to create fermionic excitation? Right, right. Yeah. So here, of course, here, of course, the point is that the excitations are there because the excitations are the reason that you don't have long range order to begin with, right? So the excitations are taken care of in this treatment and they're also there when you don't have a boost in the system. You have these low energy modes, okay? And, right. So, so, so what the boost is doing is the boost is selectively sort of populating modes moving in one direction compared to modes moving in the other direction. So that is, so that is what the boost is doing here. In, well, okay, so, so right now there are no phase slips because everything is still a Luttinger liquid. Meaning that the phase slips are not destroying superconductivity. So what is happening is something like this. Superconductivity remains, you're boosting it, it is superconducting, it is a Luttinger liquid up to the point where you boosted it so much that you can no longer linearize about one of the Fermi points. Beyond that, of course, you know, your vacuum is not a filled Fermi C anymore. So this treatment breaks down, okay? 
and so 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 there is so yeah so i guess the point here is that the way super connectivity is being destroyed here is not because of facelifts but because of the fact that these collective excitations which are bosonic excitations that you get from linearizing no longer work when you have posted it somewhere. but i am going to talk about facelifts in the remaining 5 minutes that i have okay um so so in case it seems surprising to you one way in which you can see that this makes sense is if you were to just calculate the superconducting pairing susceptibility for this kind of dispersion. Um, this is the formula for the supercycle. The superconducting pairing susceptibility um, uh, for this 1D system with this um, uh, cosine dispersion. And you calculate it with and without a boost. And what you find is that the ratio of the susceptibility with a boost divided by without a boost increases as you increase the boost, which tells you that the system becomes a better and better superconductor. So this is something which you can calculate just with the, you know, one dimensional uh, minus 2t cosine k dispersion and see that the result that you get from bosonizing does make sense. Okay. Okay, we didn't, yeah, I guess here it probably doesn't. So, so, um, Right, so this is really what you do, you know, what you're doing is you're doing it for a system of free fermions and you are uh, boost, yeah, so that's a good question. I don't know what it means for this system to have this indef indefinitely increasing without it coming down as a function. Right, I'm, yes, so you, you know, so, so what you're doing is you have free fermions and then you're asking what is the susceptibility towards pairing when you add a small attractive interaction. Right, we haven't, but yeah, but that's a, that's a good point. Okay, um, fine. So since you mentioned facelifts, so remember that what was important here was that we had a lattice which was required to break Galilean invariance. Now the lattice can have um, a non-trivial effect even when you don't have a boost, which is that, um, so let's say you were looking at spindles fermions. Um, if you have the right filling, it can turn out that the effect of a lattice can allow you to have uh, a process where two left movers become two right movers or vice versa. So momentum is now conserved only modulo a reciprocal lattice vector. And this is called ohm clap. So this is operative only at half filling on a lattice. Um, it's interesting that you can have a process which is in quotes like ohm clap um, without a lattice when you have spin half fermions. And this has to do with basically left right movers going to left right movers. But because you now have an additional label of spin, what was earlier a left moving spin up can now become a right moving spin, oh, sorry, this should be down, I'm sorry, this arrow should be down. And so basically the, the spin ups and the spin downs can one, you know, can go from being left to right movers, but on the whole you have both one left mover and one right mover before and after the, the um, process. Okay. So anyway, so there's a way in which this can happen for spin half fermions even in the continuum. Now, uh, why am I talking about both of these uh, together? That's because it turns out that when you in, want to include the effect of these processes, then the Hamiltonian that I wrote down has to be modified. And it has to be modified to something called a sine Gordon Hamiltonian. So you end up picking up an extra uh, factor like this, okay, where new, so now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a treatment where I have, where I can, I can have both charge and spin, and the charge and the spin degrees of freedom separate, that is spin charge separation in one dimension, each of them has a Hamiltonian like this for their low energy physics with their own Luttinger parameter, their own fields, um, and their own velocities. So the, the label, new labels, charge and spin, okay, and you have this extra term. And it turns out that this extra term can actually open a gap, okay, uh, that it can destroy the Luttinger liquid. And you can, you can look at that in the language of the renormalization groups. So you can write down flow equations for the Luttinger parameter and this, and it turns out that what happens is that, so the y here is g, I mean, I'm, I apologize for the notation, I just pinched this from Giamaki's book rather than drawing my own figure. But, um, so what happens is that <clears throat> depending on what your Luttinger parameter was, your bare Luttinger parameter was, you could, as you run the RG flow, flow to a Luttinger liquid, which is everything to the right of KC, with this g becoming irrelevant. So when g is irrelevant, you have a Luttinger liquid. And when g is relevant, you open a gap. And whether or not you open a gap or you flow to a Luttinger liquid depends on which side of this line you started from, okay? Uh, so these are the RG flow equations in case you're interested, but let me not dwell on them too much. So now the question is what happens when you have a boost? 
for this kind of system. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so it turns out that the RG flow equations are unaffected, and all that happens is that the initial bare values change. Okay. And so you get some slightly messy expressions for the bare values. But long story short, it turns out that if you had spinless fermions, then a boost can actually open a gap, right? Um, so when you, you know, um, by applying a boost, you can actually take a, a, a point which is on this side in terms of bare parameters to the other side of the line and open a gap uh, for spinless fermions. Whereas for, um, okay, let me just skip. Skip that slide, but also spin half fermions, the opposite effect happens, and that has to do with the scaling dimension of the bosonic field in the two cases. I can tell you, give you the details if you're interested. But the interesting thing is that for spin half fermions, the boost can actually close a gap, it doesn't open a gap, so it has different effects for um, uh, for spin, uh, spinless and spin half fermions. And it turns out that this gives you an interesting possibility, possibility to create something called a Luther Emery fluid, but let me not go into that. Um, so these are my conclusions, that a boost can have a non-trivial effect on algebraic order in 1D uh, for non-parabolic bands, and it can actually, for a simplest kind of dispersion on a lattice, strengthen superconductivity, and it can open or close gaps uh, if Ohm clap is operative. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>